Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. So here's a question. Now, and be honest, okay? Be honest. I, I, I'm assuming you will. When you hear the word, if I was to say, how many sheep out here do we got today? How many of you would say, yeah? You know, I'm proud to be a sheep. Most people would, no way. Because if you see like on social media or something, a sheep it seems like it's a bad thing, you know? You're just a follower, you know? You need to cut your, blaze your own trail. You need to be a leader. You need to be a goat or whatever. And I understand some of that, and that's okay. But in, in context of what the Bible teaches, the Bible talks about people like sheep, but what we're going to see today, it's okay to be a sheep in this context when you are allowing Jesus to be the shepherd, and you're following his voice, following his lead. You follow me on that? So now, how many sheep do I have today? Okay, all right, we have a few more. It's okay, it's okay. All right, cool. So we are going to take uh, the next, this week and next week, it's, this is going to be a two-parter, uh, and, and it worked, um, the theme is based on Psalm 23, a short, you know, short chapter. Probably you've heard some of these verses before, but what we're going to do is just do a ver- verse by verse. We're going to take it and break it down a little bit. And hopefully, my hope is that when we go through this, we would have a better understanding of who God is, and, and also it would expand our relationship with Him and how we relate to Him. And I hope that we would walk away like, man, I feel like I, I have a little better understanding or a, better, a little better knowing of who God is. So that's the hope. The theme, the title is, The Lord is My Shepherd. And we're going to start in John chapter 10, and we're going to read verses 11 through 15. It says this. Now, this is Jesus speaking. He says, I am the good shepherd. Seems like just starting off here, he's, he's, there's, he's making a contrast, like not, not, not all are good shepherds, but I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. Does that sound like something Jesus would do? Yeah? Okay. A hired man will run when he sees the wolf coming, and he will leave the sheep, for they aren't his, and he isn't their shepherd. And so the wolf leaps on them and scatters the flock. The hired man runs because he is hired and has no real concern for the sheep. Do you think Jesus has real concern for the sheep? Yeah. Verse 14, Jesus says, I am the good shepherd and know my own sheep, and they know me. Just as my Father knows me, and I know the Father, and this is crazy, and I lay down my life for the sheep. Now think about this. It's a sheep. (laughs) Now, I don't know, honestly, this may sound bad, I don't know if most people have a real high regard for sheep. They think, yeah, you know. I, sorry if, if you disagree with me, but that's the sense I get, is we don't see sheep as a real valuable animal a lot of times. But Jesus does. <laughs> but why would you lay down your life for this animal? But it, as we know, and as we go further, he is the good shepherd, and we are the sheep of his pasture, the Bible teaches us. And he truly did lay down his life for his sheep, which is amazing. So now, as I told you, we're going we're gonna to focus on Psalm 23. Now, Psalm 23 was written about a thousand years earlier than what we just read. That's a long time, right? So a thousand years earlier, these words were written, and they were written from or by King David. Do you remember what King David did before he was a king? He was a younger boy. He was a shepherd boy. So I thought, man, that's interesting. The things that he's writing about were the very things that he probably put into practice and believed, and this is how he was with his sheep. But I'm sure the things that he's saying go beyond, you know, 
uh, especially when it correlates to who God is. But of course, King David wrote this. Psalm is another way of saying a song, S-O-N-G, a song wrote by David. And I'm going to read a few verses and then we're going to go back and break them down. It says, the Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing or I shall not want. Goes on. He makes me lie down in green pastures and he leads me beside quiet waters or he leads me beside still waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the paths or the right paths for his namesake. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for whose name? For his namesake. It's like his reputation or something is on the line here. He, he, he's taking this real serious, this shepherd. Like, he, for his namesake. Okay, so let's go back and let's, let's start in on this with the first verse. The Lord is my shepherd. This implies a significant relationship between a human being and their maker. The Lord is my shepherd. This is a human becoming a valued object of a supernatural God. And then the next part to that is, I shall not want. I have all that I need. I wonder if we would make that kind of bold declaration. I shall not want. I have all that I need. This is a proud, positive, bold statement. And it's saying, I've got confidence in my shepherd's character. This is a sheep that is satisfied with its owner. To not want means not lacking, not deficient, being properly cared for and managed not craving anything more than him. Now, this is a little side note, but one of the things that I heard that shepherds would do, and I thought, that's interesting, they would would have reeds or they would make instruments out of reeds and and, and maybe even other wood things, and they would play. They would, like, and they would, like, sing songs over the sheep, and the she- it would like bring comfort, and the sheep would recognize, of course, recognize the shepherd's voice, but the sound, and just the atmosphere that, and it reminds me of God singing over you, you know? He, he just, he took this seriously. So, just this sense that the shepherd takes real good care of the flock. The Lord is my shepherd. This is saying I am completely satisfied with his management in my life. He is the shepherd where there's no trouble too great as he cares for his flock because the shepherd is fond of his sheep. He loves them for their own sake, but he also has, he takes personal pleasure in them. Do you know that God takes pleasure in you? He, he delights in you. I hope you know that. He delights in you. The shepherd is on the job 24-7 to ensure that the sheep are provided for in every detail. The shepherd is jealous of his high reputation as the good shepherd. I wonder if it would be said of of this flock here, the us, that man, their God takes good care of them. And you would reflect him in such a way that, man, he's, 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 a, he's good. He guides and protects. He leads. There's an old song, he guides and protects and he keeps me from some wrecks. You guys know that old audio adrenaline song? I don't know if you know that, probably don't. Um, so this is the thing, that's what the good shepherd does. He does that. Says that he's, and he's deeply satisfied when he sees his sheep content, well fed, cared for, safe, and flourishing under his care. Have you ever thought about God that way? I hope today we will. He, he not only loves his sheep, but his love goes the distance and his love lays down his life 
for the sheep. He says in John, the Bible says in John 10, 10, Jesus speaks, I have come that they may have life and have it more abundantly. When we talk about um, the Lord prospering you, man, I would say in every way, financial, that's great, but, uh, but we're talking about mental prosperity, physical prosperity, just, just at peace with God, blessing and favor. The shepherd, first thing in the morning, he rises to check out his sheep. And with a practiced, searching eye and compassionate eye, he examines the sheep to see that they are fit and able to be on their feet. He will count the sheep. Remember the story when there was the 99, where there was one missing, he'd leave the 99 to get the one? How would he know? He counts the sheep. He's got a watchful eye. Your, your life do, does not go under the ra- or outside of the radar. God knows you full well. And also, through the night, the shepherd listens for the least sign of trouble, and he will leap up at any time to protect his sheep. Amen? That's cool, huh? Then it goes on to say, he makes me lie down in green pastures. He makes me lie down in green pastures. The strange thing about sheep is that because of their very makeup, it's almost impossible for them to lie down and to rest unless four requirements are met. See if you can identify with any of these. Have you ever had any of these keep you up at night? Sheep are timid, and they refuse to lie down unless they are free from all fear. You ever had fear keep you up? Naturally, even, you know, keep you awake, but also fear just keep you just in turmoil? Okay. Secondly, free from friction with others of their kind. You know, have you ever not been in a good related to sheep kind of button heads, I guess you could say? You ever not in, been in a friction or been in a friction relationship with somebody else and it just it messes with you. It's hard to lie down and experience rest and peace. Thirdly, free from flies or parasites. Have you ever had things that just bug the living daylights out of you? Just little things and people's words and this and that and it just bug you. Okay, number four, free from hunger. The sheep have to be free from hunger so they're no longer searching for food. You see, in and of themselves, sheep cannot free themselves. They need desperate help from the shepherd. So that's why it says, he makes me lie down. This isn't a forceful act, but this is confidence in the fact that he enables me to rest. There's no substitute for the awareness that your shepherd is nearby. He's on alert. There's nothing like Christ's presence to drive away the fear, the panic, and terror of the unknown. You got to know, we got to know that God has everything under his control. The Bible says in 2 Timothy 1.7, for God did not give us a spirit of fear or timidity, but a spirit of power of love and of self-discipline or a sound mind. Now, I want to come back to this free from hunger one, the number four, that the sheep needs to be free from hunger and no longer searching from food in order to experience rest. I want you to think about this. Think about the land of Bethlehem. I don't know if you've ever seen maps or if you, maybe you don't know anything about it, but this is a dry, can be barren, sunburned land. So, The question is, how can you be free from hunger if you're a sheep in a place like that? Well, let me tell you. Green pastures that we were reading about, they just didn't happen by chance. Green pastures were the product of tremendous labor, time, and skill. There needed to be a cleaning and a clearing of rough, 
rocky land, tearing out the brush, clearing out roots and stumps. There was deep plowing. There was careful soil preparation. Then there's seeding. There's planting. There's irrigating. Do you know what this represents? It it represents much work, skill, and time for the careful shepherd. And Jesus says that he is the good shepherd. He knows what he's working with, and he knows who he's working with. And what he does is he tends, he cares, and he cultivates our lives. Because he longs to see our lives become green, symbolizing health and productivity. And this is all because of the unrelenting energy of an owner who wishes to see his sheep satisfied and cared for. Do you know the good shepherd this way today? The good shepherd has supplied green pastures for those who care to move on to them and there find peace and provision. He he won't force you to green pastures, but he will lead you to green pastures. He will lead if he leads, will we follow? He leads me also beside quiet or still waters. The shepherd knows where the best drinking places are. The best drinking places. And it's normally with much effort that the shepherd has provided those watering holes or those watering places. And when sheep are thirsty, what ends up happening, they become restless and they act and they they set out in search of water to satisfy their thirst. But here's the, here can be the problem. If they're not led to pure, clean water, pure water, they will often end up drinking from polluted potholes where they can pick up eternal parasites and other diseases. You follow me here? So in the, other way, in, in the same way, Christ, our good shepherd, he made it clear that thirsty souls of men and women can only be truly satisfied when their thirst for spiritual life is fully quenched by drawing on himself. In Matthew 5, 6, the Bible says, blessed or blessed are those which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled, or they shall be satisfied. How many of us have drunk from the wrong, the wrong watering hole to try to satisfy a craving, a longing on the inside, and, and in so doing, got some parasites, you know, some, some ickies? Do you know what I'm talking about? Okay. Jesus said at a great feast in Jerusalem, if any man thirst, or any woman thirst, anybody thirst, let him come unto me and drink. To drink means to take in, to accept, to believe. You see, the very life of God becomes part of you. The only God knows how to lead you and I to still, quiet, clean, satisfying, pure water. In John seven thirty seven, on the last day and the greatest day of this festival... It says, Jesus stood and said in a loud voice, he says, let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as scriptures has said, as the scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from within them. By this, he meant the spirit whom those who believed in him were later to receive. Because up to that time, the spirit had not been given since Jesus had not been glorified, had not been resurrected. But the Bible says, He restores my soul. He renews my strength. You know David, the shepherd boy, then the king, he knew what it meant 
to need his soul strengthened. Not only did David experience persecution and, tr- and, st- and, struggle, and struggle from the outside, he had enemies trying to kill him, but David didn't make all the right choices in his life too. David committed adultery with Bathsheba, and from that, he, he had some battles on the inside. You know, so, we're, you know, just a, he knew what it was like to, to need restoration and healing. And as a matter of fact, he says in verse 42 of Psalm, verse 11, it says, he says to himself, why are you cast down, O my soul? Why so disturbed within me? Then he says to himself, this is talking to yourself. It's okay, you can do that. Put your hope in God. Sometimes you gotta tell yourself that. For yet I will praise him, my Savior and my God. You see, David knew what it meant to be cast down and rejected. He had tasted defeat in his life. He experienced frustration while falling or failing under temptation. The bitterness, the hopelessness, the hopelessness. The lack of, you know, strength that is, is seen even in this prayer that he prayed. I wonder for you today, have you ever needed restoration? This is what can happen. Sheep can become cast down at times. What's that mean? It means that they end up on their backs and they can't get up. And there's different ways that they end up on their backs. And here's the thing, if they're left there very long, they can die. Have you ever felt kind of like you're out of commission, you're on your back? Maybe physically, but just spiritually, just you're kind of out, you know? Ever needed to be restored? It's good news. Let Let me share a couple ways real quick that sheep can become cast down. The first one is this, the comfort zone. Sheep will lie down to get comfortable they'll stretch out to relax, and then all of a sudden their center of gravity switches and they end up on their backs. Well, what does this mean for you and me? There can be great danger in looking for the soft spot in life, the the comfortable place, the easy place, the place where there's the least amount of hardship or there's no need for endurance or self-discipline. And we just get real, real comfortable. That can be a place where we could become cast down as a sheep. <laughs> so secondly, here's another one. This one's ready for this one. Are you guys ready for this? And this, this is a little bit more ouchy maybe. There's too much wool on the sheep. What do you mean too much wool? How many of you need a haircut? Okay, too much wool. What happens with sheep that have too much wool is this. Their fleece becomes matted with mud, manure, burrs, and there's other debris that get in it. And what happens, the fleece, their own wool, literally will weigh them down. You follow me, right? Okay, hopefully you are. Wool represents the old self-life for the Christian. The clinging to the accumulation of things possessions, worldly ideas and practices, and they will begin to weigh us down. They'll begin to drag us down, and they'll hold you back. And in these times, you need to get the shears out. We need to allow the shears of God's Word, the wool, to be cut off. I believe, for some of us, over the last few years, God has been cutting wool off our lives. He's been cutting some things, removing some things, things that have been accumulating and not necessary in our lives. And our shepherd, at times, will apply the cutting edge of his word to our lives. Have you ever had him do that? Yeah, yeah. And he begins, this is the good news, he begins to set us free from ourselves. And you know what? That's an amazing restoration. What what a restoration it is. And God knows what he's doing when he's working with us. 
Remember? The good shepherd, he knows how to lead, guide, direct, correct. Next week, we're going to go into some more of that. That, that staff, that rod, what are they used for? Okay? The good shepherd knows what he's doing. And he will lead or he will guide us to paths of righteousness for his name's sake. You see, sheep are notorious creatures of habit, maybe much like us. Left to themselves, they will follow the same trails until those trails become ruts. They'll also graze the same hills until those hills that they're grazing in turn to desert waste. They will pollute their own ground until it's corrupt with disease and parasites. And this is the owner, the shepherd. His entire name and reputation depends how effectively and efficiently he keeps his sheep moving onto wholesome, new, fresh feeding lands. He takes this responsibility personally. It says his reputation is at line for his name's sake. You see, our behavior patterns and habits are mu- much like that of sheep. We can be, you and I, we can be stiff-necked and stubborn. Book of Isaiah 53, 6 t- says this, we all like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. Each of us have our times of struggling with doing things our way versus God's way. And we have to be led to passive righteousness. And sometimes we choose to be stubborn. And we want to follow old paths. And we want to graze in old polluted ground. But we have to choose. Will we follow our good shepherd to paths of righteousness? or not. So if, if you want to discover fresh new ground, I'm going to share three simple things. Number one is this. We have to choose to no longer love myself most or ourselves most, but love Christ most. Number two, be more God conscious than people conscious. What do I mean by that? Just because something is accepted by the world doesn't mean that it's honoring to God. That's one thing. But also, there are times in your life that you're going to go against the grain, swimming upstream. It's just the the way it is. You're going to not, it it may be uncomfortable. It might cut against the grain of things in your life, but you're going to realize, you know, I'm going to live on more so God's opinion of me versus man's opinion of me. And finally, Finally, we have to do what God asks us to do. Will we be a follower of Jesus Christ? If he is our shepherd, will we follow his lead? And sometimes we don't, but if we want to experience this fresh new ground, new abundant life in God, we're going to have to obey him and follow him. So today, as we close... Maybe today you would say, I, I, I want to follow God maybe for the first time in your life. I want to put my faith in him and trust him as the shepherd of my life. And what I'd like to do, let me do this. I want to pray a simple prayer, and then we're going to pray a prayer really of salvation. I want to pray this first prayer of God. You are our shepherd. We thank you, God, that you chose to to lead the way, to guide us. And we we say, God, we're, we're pleased with your care of our life. You make us lie down in green pastures. You lead us beside quiet waters. You refresh our soul. And Lord God, we want your name to be glorified. I pray that our life would reflect you well. We love you, God. Amen. 
I want to pray a second prayer for those that maybe today you want to give your life to God for the very first time, or maybe it's a recommitment to God. I'm going to, I'm going to lead us in a prayer. I would invite all of us to pray this, but if today this is, you're, you're really praying this and you're saying, I want to begin a new journey with God where he's my shepherd and I'm following his voice and his lead. Would you just repeat this prayer after me? If we could all pray this, can we say, dear God, I need you. Save me. I confess that I have sinned. I need forgiveness. Jesus, forgive me. Save me and set me free. I choose to follow you today. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.